Amen. So the title of this, mer- uh, this morning's sermon is The Satanic Attack on the King James Version. The Satanic Attack on the King James Version. And, you know, there's a, this is a big subject. We could spend a, a lot of time talking about this because there really are a lot of attacks on the King James Version. There's a lot of different angles that people take, uh, you know, and it would be too much in just one sermon to try and debunk all of that. So we'll just touch on a few things, but really, whenever I preach on this topic, the one thing I really want to drive home and for people to understand is that we believe the King James Bible is the Word of God by faith. You know, we're never looking for other people to come along and, you know, convince us that the, the, word, that the Bible is the Word of God, that the King James is inerrant, inspired, and preserved in the English language today. We accept that by faith, you know, and, and, and some out there would mock that fact. The fact that we take that by faith, they would say, oh, well, why do you believe the King James Bible is the Word of God? Because it says it is. And, you know, that is circular reasoning. But that's what it means to, to, to accept these things by faith. Uh, I believe the King James Bible, and for other reasons, because of the power that it has, because of the, the, uh, the effects that it has on people's lives to save them, to change them, uh, and the, the way it's written, the, the beauty of it. You know, only God could write such a book. There's a lot of reasons why uh, I believe it by faith. But, I want, and, but there is a big attack today. You know, there is a, there's a real agenda today to <coughs> discourage us from reading the King James Bible to reading other versions, to, to reading watered-down versions, reading versions that have <coughs> uh, I mean, uh, changed the Word of God, changed doctrine. And I want to just, t- we'll touch on a few of those things this morning, but really, again, what I want us to walk away from this morning, the sermon, is understanding that the attack is real and that the, the, the best way to just, you know, uh, shore yourself up on this issue is to understand that ultimately, no matter what any critic says, is that you have to come to the place where you believe the King James Bible is what it says it is by faith. Now you're there in Isaiah chapter 40. You know, this is one of those great verses that tell us why I, you know, why I believe the uh, King James Bible is the inspired, inerrant, and preserved Word of God today. It says, The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the Word of our God shall stand forever. You know, that's a promise out of the Word of God. You know, God's not just going to, you know, isn't just some far away, distant being who just wants us to, you know, grope in the darkness, hoping to understand who he is or what it is he wants from us or, you know, uh, where we came from or where we're going. God wants us to know all these things. And that's why he gave us the Bible. You know, God is a loving God. He's a merciful God. He's, a, he's long-suffering. And he wants us to know who he is. He wants us to know what his will is. So it only makes sense that he would tell us through a book. You know, he would give us a book that he would preserve himself. And it doesn't need to be rediscovered. It doesn't need to be found in some clay pot in some monastery somewhere that was used as a trash can. It doesn't need to be found and unearthed today. We have the entire Word of God. Everything that God wants us to know for this life is in your King James Bible. So that's one great promise there. What about the, the promises over in Matthew? Now keep something in Isaiah this morning. We'll be back and forth in Isaiah a few times. But go to Isaiah chapter 59. I'll, while you're going to Isaiah 59, I'll remind you of some other great verses that are the promises of God that He has preserved His Word for us today. I, uh, Psalms 126. The, uh, the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. You know, God has promised that He is going to preserve His Word. Matthew chapter 5, Verily I say unto you, Jesus speaking, Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. What about uh, uh, verses like Psalms 119? For, uh, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. These are great, precious promises. Why do I believe that the, the King James Bible is the word of God? Because it says it is. Because of verses like this. When I read them, the, his spirit bears witness with my spirit, and I know that I have the word of God by faith. <clears throat> John 1.11, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. You know the, the, you know, the Bible is an amazing book because it says, you know, it is God. You're holding the Lord Jesus in your hands. Not the literal, you know, body of Jesus, but he is the word of God. That's what you're reading this morning. Isaiah chapter 59, verse 21, where you are. As for me, this is my covenant with them. I say it the Lord, my spirit that is upon thee and my words which I have put in thy mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed's seed, saith the Lord from henceforth and forever. You know, that was a promise that God made to Isaiah that the words that he was going to put in his mouth and send him to preach 
were going to be preserved from generation to generation to generation. And that's exactly what you have in the book of Isaiah. You have the words that God put in Isaiah's mouth, preserved even unto this generation. It was a promise he kept to Isaiah as well. Go over to, back to Isaiah chapter 40. You know, we read these promises, we read these, these verses, you know, and the believer, he rejoices at them. He doesn't scratch his head and wonder, is that really true? Did God mean that? We read that and we say, praise God, praise the Lord, that he's made such wonderful promises to us that he would preserve his word to us. That's why the psalmist said in 119, oh, how I, oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. You know when you really start to love the Word of God is when you really understand that that's exactly what it is, the Word of God. When you really start to love it and meditate upon it and think about it and want to be reading it and want to be memorizing it and want to be living it is when you begin to understand what you really have in your hands. That you, in fact, do have the Word of God in the King James Bible. <clears throat> and ultimately, as I've already said, it's believed by faith. You know, we say, well, we believe it by faith. And people mock and they scoff at that you know, even people who claim to believe in God, even people who who play lip service to Christianity or even call themselves Christian so-called, you know, they'll they'll say, "Oh yeah, we believe in God. We believe that, you know, that all these books are God's word." You know, they'll they'll pay lip service, but then at the the irony is that they turn around, they profess a faith in an almighty God, and then and then doubt whether or not he can preserve a book. I mean, how hard is it to preserve a book when you're God? You know, like they, they all say, oh, yeah, God created everything. You know, God does this. God does that. God's all powerful. But I mean, could he really? I mean, come on. 1,189 chapters. I don't think so. That's too hard for God. The Bible says, is there anything too hard for God? Look there in Isaiah chapter 40. I mean, Isaiah chapter 40 is such a great passage, such a great chapter. So many things we could preach. But look at verse 12. Who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and meted out heaven with the span? and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains and scales and the hills in a balance. Well, I'll tell you, as the Lord. Yep. I mean, God takes up all the waters of the earth in, in the hollow of his hand. You know, we're, we look out there at these mountains that surround us. God weighs them. God knows how much they weigh. God has measured out all the dust, all the earth that there is. Who hath, verse 13, Who hath directed the Spirit of the Lord, or being his counselor, taught him? With whom took he counsel, and who instructed him? and taught him in the path of judgment, and taught him knowledge, and showed him the way of understanding. You know, they want to say, oh, yeah, we believe in this almighty God, but pff, no way. You know, we understand, yeah, he can do all these great things that Isaiah is talking about here, but to preserve a book is just beyond him. He just, you know, the, the binding or something. I don't know, what is it? Man produces these books just in mass. We order them by crate loads. You know, of, of course God can write a book and preserve it unto man. There's nothing he can't do. And I say to those people that would doubt whether or not God could preserve his word in the English language, perfect. I'm saying without error this morning. Nothing in your King James Bible has error in it. It's a complete word of God. It's perfect. You say, well, I don't know about that. Well, uh, you know what? Do you doubt God? That would be my question to them. Do you, is your God really that powerful or not? Uh, if you would, turn over to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. You know, we have to accept these things by faith, ultimately. I can get up to here and, and we could talk about all the text, you know, you know, try to debunk all the textual criticisms and go over the long, you know, history of all the different versions leading up to the King James and the underlying Greek text and the Hebrew. But you know what? I don't speak Greek and I don't speak Hebrew. And you know what? I don't need to. And we'll get into that in a minute here. But ultimately, the point I'm trying to make right now is that you have to believe this by faith. That's, that's the thrust of this message. That's what I want you to walk out this morning. You know, if you've been one that's kind of doubting, maybe scratching your head, not really sure, maybe these other, there is something to these other versions, or maybe the King James, you know, is, is warrants the criticism that it, it receives. Maybe there's a reason why everybody's attacking it. Be, you know, you're starting to doubt. You know, I want to shore you up on this and understand you have to believe these things by faith. The Bible says, you're going to Hebrews 4, but it says in Hebrews 11, without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You know, it's not pleasing to God when you, when you open up the King James Bible and say, I believe this if you could prove it to me. Oh Lord, if you could just give me a sign to believe that this, this book is true, then I'd believe it. God's not pleased with that. God's not going to open up your eyes so that you may behold wondrous things out of his law when you read it, if that's your attitude when you open it. Well, I'll see if there's anything in here that, you know, maybe doesn't jive. 
Maybe it doesn't make sense. Maybe there is an error. You know, well, maybe if God would just prove it to me. You know, when you open up your Bible and you believe it by faith and you, you start your, bi your daily Bible reading by saying, this is the word of God that I'm reading. I believe that by faith. God's pleased with that. God looks down and he'll bless you while you read. So it's, you know, the, the, the Bible, you know, is believed by faith. But God doesn't just leave us hanging there. Like, we, we just have to constantly be every day, like, reassuring ourselves that the Bible is the word of God. Every day we crack open our Bible to read it, and it's a big you know, leap of faith that we're reading the Word of God. No, because as we, when we come to the Word of God, we accept it by faith, and when we begin to read it, you know what happens? He start, God confirms it by the power of the Word of God. We close our Bibles and say, yeah, no doubt, that was powerful. Something speaks to you, brings a tear to your eye, brings conviction of sin, moves you to, to serve God with your life. Whatever it might be, you read that book, and it's not, it's not just for entertainment. It's changing you. It's molding you. It's shaping you. It's inspiring you. You know, it's confirmed by the power. We step out in faith. We read it, and then we're we're confirmed by the power of the word of God. It says there in Hebrews four verse twelve, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. The word of God is quick. You know, meaning it's alive. That's what that word means. It's alive. It's a living book that speaks to us through His word. It's powerful. It has power in it. It's strength. It's going to make an impact upon us. It's sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even a dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. You know, we read the Bible, and God, we still have to read things, and we'll go, whoa, that strikes close to home. We'll have something going on in our life or, or whatever, and we'll read something, and God will, you know, either assure us of something or convict, uh, convict us about something that's going on in our heart, you know, whatever it might be. God, God knows our hearts and he takes his word and he discerns what's in it and shows us what's in our own hearts. No other book does that. You know, no other book has that power. <clears throat> so we see, first of all, that you know, we come to the word of God. We have the promises of the word of God. We believe them by faith. They're confirmed by the power that's in the word of God when we read it. But also, you know, we, we understand the word of God by the spirit of, the, of, the, of God. You know, people, the, the Bible says, the natural man receiveth not the, of the things of the Spirit of God, neither can he know them, for they are spiritually discerned. But, you know, we who have the Spirit, we can open up the Bible and go, this makes sense. I'm not saying we understand everything, but we at least have the ability to understand everything that's in there. You know, and a lot of things that people stumble over. I remember before I, remember before I got saved, just a few, I mean, like maybe less than a year before I got saved. You know, I was trying to study all these different religions and figure all this other stuff out, reading all these other books. And some things happened, and I said, okay, all right, I'll, I'll, read the, I'll, read, I'll read the Bible. You know, I was kind of putting off. I had already kind of written off Christianity, you know, because I knew it had rules in it and stuff. And that's the last thing I wanted in my life, being a rebel. So I read it, and I said, well, my middle name's John, so I'm going to start with the book of John. And I know I've expressed this in here before, but, you know, I got into it. I didn't get very far into it. All I saw was some hairy dude wearing camel skin and, and eating bugs in the desert. I didn't get it. I was just like, well... Tried it. You know, but after I got saved, you know, I started to read about those things. And it wasn't just some hairy dude eating bugs. I mean, it was, it was the forerunner of Christ. You know, it was him that came, you know, he, he that came to make his way straight and his, his paths plain and to proclaim, you know, the, the, the Lord's coming. You know, I started to understand the things of the Word of God. So, yeah, we, we step out in faith and, and, and trust the promises of the Word of God. And we're confirmed by what we, what we believe by the power of the Word of God. And then we understand the Word of God by the Spirit of God. And really, you know, the, a great example of people not getting it, I ran into this the other day out soul winning. A person unsaved who thinks they know something about the Bible or spiritual things, and they go right over their head. They read something in the Bible, and they just stumble at it. It's a stumbling block because they have not the Spirit. You know, I'm knocking this door, and I, and I ta started talking to the mom. You know, I assumed it was this guy's wife, although the guy was a little, you know... Maybe it was her queer uncle or something. I don't know. The guy was definitely a femi. But he, he and I start talking to her and inviting her. I'm trying to get to the gospel. And he just pokes his head out. and Oh, what church are you from? And I told him where I'm from. Who's your pastor? I told him. And he didn't say whether or not he recognized our pastor or not. But he instantly dives into the King James issue. He's like, did you know the King James is missing 17 verses? I said, really? Which 17? Oh, I'm not sure. Couldn't tell me that, but then he, he, he proceeded, and I'm just the whole time just, like, just boiling over, like, 
first of all, you sound like a total fag, dude. <laughs> you know, and I'm here trying to give the gospel. And the only reason I didn't just go off is because there was this teenage, I assume it was their son standing behind and was kind of watching everything. I said, well, let me just be a good example here of, of patience and virtue and, and mercy and long suffering towards this young man. You know, so I was like, okay, well, you know, I believe the Bible is inspired and preserved in the King James Version. And I said, if you'd like to know more about it, you can watch our documentary. Have a nice day. And I didn't get into some long, drawn-out debate there at the door with some guy who, you know, probably just heard something, you know. And, but one of the things this guy pointed out in this, con this short conversation, he said, you know, the King James has mistakes in it. You know, why did the translators, when they wrote down the Ten Commandments, why did they say kill? Why did it say thou shalt not kill? I said, well, Jesus clarified that later, you know, what he meant, what that exactly what that means, that thou shalt do no murder. Yeah, so why didn't they get that right when they wrote it down the first time? Oh, I don't know, maybe because everybody who reads that assumes that's what that means, right. you know, for the by and large, except for maybe unsafe people like you, sir. Right. You know, uh, that when, God, when Jesus said thou shalt not kill, he wasn't talking about going out pulling weeds out of the garden. Right. You know, when you pull a weed up out of the ground, you just killed it. Yeah, right. Don't kill the weeds, you know, like... What, well, how far do you want to go with thou shalt not kill? Right. You know, don't step on an ant. Don't swat a fly. You know, it, it's stupid. It's moronic. But that's what unsafe people do. Yeah. They read things like that and whoop, it goes right over the head. You know, and the thing is, like, th you know, th we were, you would have already understood that by the time you got to the Ten Commandments because you would have read when Noah got off the ark and God said, you know, whosoever sheddeth man's blood by, his, by man shall his blood be shed. Right. He'd already established what he meant by that. That, that if you kill somebody, you know, you're not, you don't do it. And if you do, you're going to die. But this is, I thought, boy, what a great example of somebody who doesn't have the Spirit of God, doesn't understand the things of God, you know, and quite frankly, you know, hopefully he, he humbles himself and watches that documentary and gets saved, right. you know, and understands that, in, that the Word of God isn't just something to be trifled with. <coughs> so... Uh, what I want to do now, you know, we talked about the introduction here about, about, you know, we come to the Word of God by faith, and we believe it by faith, you know, we're, we're confirmed by the power, and we understand it by the Spirit. And the unsaved don't. They don't get it. And that's where a lot of these attacks come from. A lot of these attacks, you know, we're going to look at just a few of these attacks, and some of them are just, you know, I started looking, I started looking into some of them, and like some of the first ones I came into, they were just ridiculous. Like, really? That's, that's why you're, 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 dismissing the, the Bible, the King James Bible, is because of this foolish uh, uh, argument. And, and I want to look at a few. Now, some of them are obviously a little bit more scholarly and sophisticated, and, they, and they, you know, they dive down deep, and we'll get into that a little bit too. But one of these uh, supposed arguments, and you won't believe this when I tell you, this was news to me. I didn't know this was out there. Now, it's coming out of what I assume is like a Hebrew roots movement because the article is ta start talking about Yah and Yahweh. And as soon as I see the word Yah or Yahweh, I just close the window. <laughs> well, you have nothing to tell me. Right. You're not saved, that's right. if that's what you believe. If you're professing, if you're saying Jesus is not the name right. given among men, which by we all must, all men must be saved. Yep. For there is one name given on, on, under heaven among uh, by which men must be saved. The name Jesus. Yep. There's one mediator between man and God, the man Christ Jesus. You know, so when they're going to say, well, Jesus isn't the name of God, that's not right. You know, I instantly have, you're unsaved, I have nothing to say to you. Like, there's no point even arguing with you. You need to come to grips with that, you know. And that's a whole other sermon. But this is, this is where I think this first argument's coming out of that kind of a crowd, okay. And they say, uh, they say, well, the King James Bible, we know, isn't the Word of God because it uses the word candle and candlestick in the New Testament. And we all know candles didn't exist back then. I'm not kidding you. This is an argument that was made. And I laughed. And then I realized, I'm thinking either this guy is just a complete unsaved, just deceived heretic, or he's trolling us. Right. You know, sometimes it's hard to tell. Well, you know what? If he's trolling us, he succeeded. I'm reacting, okay? You know, I got trolled by this guy, okay? But that's what they say. They say, now, <laughs> did you hear what I said? The king, you got to throw away your King James because he used the word candle. It's retarded. Yep. But this is what's out there. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know that I need to go into the history of candles with you, but candles have, you can go to, if you want to know more, if you're, if you're, if you're struggling in this area, just go to candles.org. I'm not kidding. This is where you can go. And you can read up on the history of candles. 
Okay, candles have been used as a source of light to illuminate celebrations for more than 5,000 years, which predates the New Testament, predates the, the, the use of the word in, in the New Testament. Yet little is known about their origin. I thought that was interesting. The earliest use of candles is often attributed to the ancient Egyptians who made rush lights or torches by soaking the pithy core of reeds into melted animal fat. However, the rush lights had no wick like a true candle, and the Romans came along and they started making them out of wax. So, sorry, you Yeshua worshiper, you know, with your false Jesus and your false God, uh, you're wrong. You know, candles, have <laughs> that's a really bad argument. Try again. So, what's another one that people go after? Go after Matthew chapter 13. You might, you who here has ever heard the candle argument? Yeah, that was new on me too, but you know, the devil's trying everything he can. He'll throw anything at the wall and see what sticks. Because some people are going to read that and be like, yeah, see, I told you. It won't be long. I guarantee you we're going to knock on someone's door. Well, that ain't the Bible. That ain't God's word. It's got the word candle in it. <laughs> yeah, that day's coming. You know, this is how these things start. You know, the internet just gets this stuff spread out there. Who's ever heard uh, them attack the parable of the mustard seed? You've heard that one? I, this one was newer to me a little few years ago. People will say, well, Jesus said that the mustard seed was the least among all seeds, and we know that it's not. And that's true. There are seeds that are smaller than the mustard seed. So we have to kind of, so, you know, sorry to just totally destroy your faith this morning. You know, it's, it's all for naught. You know, if you, if you just knew that one thing about the mustard seed. But they use this, and they, this is something that they, they, people, the critics and the attacks, uh, or attackers of the Word of God, they lean heavy on this. This is one of their main go-tos. So Matthew chapter 13, verse 31, just to review the parable, he says, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which is indeed the least of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs, and becometh a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. thereof. So scoffers, what they do is they point out that there are smaller seeds that exist today. And, you know, you could talk about there's a whole bunch, there's a few that I'm not, you know, this isn't a botany class, so I'm not going to dive deep into this, but what the smallest known seed is that of the jewel orchard, which is like 0 .05, 0 .005, I don't know, it's like nearly microscopic. You know, a mustard seed is small, but you could still see it. You know, you could feel it, it's in your hand. But, so there is a much smaller seed than the mustard seed. But, so you say, well, now we got to, you know, we got to explain this, you know, well, first of all, we really don't. I mean, the bottom line with this is that Jesus is speaking in a proverb here. You know, he's speaking proverbially. And you have to kind of take in the context of the time. Do you think they knew back then that, that there was a smaller seed? Like, why, what would Israelite farmers have to do with jewel orchards? You know, that, that plant didn't even really, wasn't even known to them. It wasn't even around back then for, the, for them to even know what it was. Well, what's going on with these critics is that they're assuming what's called a uniformitarian view of speciation, right? They're assuming that everything is evolving or adapting at the same rate then as it is now. They, that, that things are changing at the same rate and they're, they're assuming that everything is kind of, so that therefore they can trace everything back. But, you know, things change so rapidly in environments. With animals and birds, they can adapt over just a j 10 years, they can change. So, I mean, you could look at the mustard seed today and say, well, that's how big it is. But is that really how big it was back then? I mean, look, look how easily man manipulates plants and vegetables. I mean, we have seedless watermelons, which takes all the fun out of it, in my, my opinion. <laughs> right? And these giant genetically modified tomatoes and, you know, you, things change quicker than people think. And that they're, at least that they're giving uh, space for. Because they don't want to admit that. They, they want a reason to doubt the Word of God. So they're going to they're gonna strain at a gnat here and swallow a camel. They assume that plants existed uh, in the form that they do today. You know? And again, I'm not trying to apologize for what Jesus said, but this is their error. Okay? I don't have a problem. I don't need this for me to, to accept the Bible as the Word of God. Could somebody turn the heat down a little bit? Anybody knows, is anybody else warming up in here? I know I am. Uh, <coughs> it, it says, uh, so the, going back to the parable, sorry about that. He says, assuming those... Uh, they assume that those hearing Jesus at that time would have knowledge of other seeds. Like, like all these, all these uh, the common man in Israel back then just, you know, just knew of all these, you know, they were all like Solomon, that they knew of birds and plants and trees, and, you know, they knew all things. Well, they didn't. You know, how many things do you, do you know about today? Are you an expert in every field of, you know, I mean, who here is an expert in botany? 
Who here has gone around and measured all the seeds in the world and figured that out? Okay. But bottom line is, is that Jesus is speaking proverbially. You know, he, he would have known that at least that, it, the, you know, the, when the mustard seed grow, grows and turns into a, a bush, it is actually not the greatest. There are others that outgrow it. Even back then, they would have known that. But he's trying to make a point, you know, and they're, and they're missing it. And Jesus, you know, he's saying, because of your unbelief, I say unto you, Matthew chapter 17, he uses this, you know, the mustard seed again, if you remember. He says, because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if you had the faith of a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible to you. Is, that, is Jesus literally telling you to move mountains here? To go and, 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 and move Mount Lemon into the sea and cast it? Please don't do that. We need that mountain. <laughs> right? Well, you know, if you can't do that, it's because you probably only have the faith the side of a jewel orchid. You know, maybe that's all, that's all the bigger your faith is. It only measures up to, you know, 0 0.005 nanometers or whatever. I don't know. You know, you have a microscopic faith. No, the point is, is he's speaking proverbially. He's just trying to make a point. And he's using terms that the people that were listening to him would have understood. They would, they would have got, oh, if I have just a little bit of faith, you know, and, and it's in God, then we can do great things for God. That's the point here. So these are just some of the, you know, <clears throat> more foolish objections that I've heard against the, the you know, the, the satanic attack on the King James Version. You know, not all of them are these brainiac, intellectual, you know, scholarly attacks. Some of them are just, they just try to get the, the, the dummies right out of the gate. Well, there's no such thing as candles back then. Well, we know there's smaller seeds than mustard seeds. Ipso facto, the Bible's not the Word of God. Throw it out. You know, I should have taken the time to look at the other versions if they updated the, 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 to the proper seed there. Or if there was a footnote, you know. But one of the more, uh, more common ones that you hear that are a little bit more scholarly in nature is when they start to reject the last 11 verses of Mark. I'm sure everybody's probably heard about that, right? Who in here has heard of that? A few people? Okay. So if you go to uh, Mark chapter 16, in fact, let me get over there myself. Mark chapter 16. What they'll say is, you know, uh, well, we know the King James Bible isn't the preserved Word of God because Mark chapter, the last 11 verses shouldn't be in Mark. And they, they have some, some reasons. And, uh, you know, and here's the thing. <laughs> what they rely on when they go back to the, you know, these underlying texts and these criticisms from other, from other texts that they find and stuff like that, you, you know, the commoner just has to take him at his word. Just trust, the, oh, I, you know, I don't speak Greek. I don't speak Hebrew. I don't. You know, I don't know all these different texts, so I guess you're, you're God to me now, scholar, textual critic. Now I'm going to make you God, and you tell me whether or not this is the Word of God. Instead of me just reading the Word of God and have it tell me that these are the very words of God, that they're preserved from generation to generation, instead of letting God's Word uh, you know, confirm what it is to me, I'm going to let some other guy come along and, and do that for me. That's what you'd have to do if you're just going to accept what these guys say. So, of course, we all uh, have Mark 16 there. And, <coughs> of course, one of, the, one of the things that they criticize in Mark chapter 16 is that they, there's this, you know, they say, well, it, it do there's a doctrinal error in it. Therefore, we know it, it doesn't belong. And by the way, it, Mark 16, the last 11 verses, it's still in there, even in these other versions. Because you just can't throw out entire sections of the Word of God. People would, would lose their minds. You know, they, they wouldn't sell them. So they just put in a footnote, you know, they, they put a little parentheses and a little asterisk, you know, point you to the note that says, this shouldn't be in there. You know, we can't take it out because you wouldn't, you know, everyone would, would get upset. But w those of us that know better than you know that it shouldn't be in there because we've studied all the, you know, s so on and so forth. But one of the things uh, they'll argue is they'll say, well, the Mark 16, the last 11 verses, it teaches the need for baptism. Therefore, we know that, you know, in order to be saved, we know that salvation is by grace through faith, that you don't need to be baptized to be saved. Sorry, Church of Christ, but that's the truth. You know, they're right about that, but then they'll say, and so when we read the last 11 verses of Mark, you know, in verse 15 in particular, you know, it seems to teach that, you know, you have to be baptized to get saved. And you'll hear the, uh, uh, you know, like the Church of Christ crowd and others who, who teach that you have to be baptized to get saved, you'll hear them go, they'll go to this passage. You know, this is their go-to. You know, but it's not, it's, you know, it's not going to cause me to flounder. So when we look here in verse 15, he, Jesus, it says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. 
He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So now when you first read that, you know, you could twist that into saying, you, you could see where people are coming from, right? You got to think a little bit about what the verse is saying. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now, is that true? Mm -hmm. Hey, if you believe on Jesus Christ and get baptized, are you saved? Yes. Absolutely. But what if you don't get baptized? You know, it goes on and says, but he that believeth not shall be damned. That is also true, isn't it? But does it say, he that believeth not and is not baptized shall be damned? See, the one thing that damns you in this verse is whether or not you believed. That's it. The doctrine hasn't changed. The thing that saves you is that you believed, and the things that damn you is you have not believed. It has nothing to do with baptism. He could have said anything there. He that believeth and chews bubblegum is saved. He that believeth and jumps rope is saved. All true statements. Now, if you don't jump rope and chew bubblegum, are you damned? I believe, but I don't chew gum and I don't jump rope. And by the way, I don't jump rope. <laughs> <laughs> and I chew big red, but anyway. <coughs> so if you know if I don't do that, am I damned? I believe, but hey, you know what? I haven't gotten baptized. I don't chew gum. I don't jump rope. That doesn't make me damned. The one thing that makes me damned is whether or not I have believed. Does everybody see that? Is that really that hard to understand? That's not really a. a you know why a lot of you are getting it? A lot of heads are nodding and saying, "Yeah, I get it." It's because you have the Spirit of God. It's because you're saved. You understand that? And when somebody just explains it as simply as that, it makes perfect sense. You go, oh, yeah, I see that. Yeah. Not other people, though. Not these critics. Well, you got to throw out Mark. You got to throw out those 11 verses right there. Just start at verse 9. Get rid of it. Cut it right out of there. You know, because look at that. Look at the error here. You know what that tells me? If you can't understand that, you're not saved, which makes perfect sense why you're attacking the Word of God the way that you are. And that you cannot believe the promises that we read earlier that God would preserve His Word. That's, it all makes sense to me why you would even do that or why you can't understand it because you're not saved. <laughs> Another argument, they'll say, well, you've got to get rid of the 11 verses here at the end of Mark because they don't match the style of Mark. You know, I, I've, never read, I've never had even noticed that. I've never gotten through my reading of Mark and been like, what a great book, but man, it just seems like somebody else wrote those last 11 verses. <laughs> you know, it just didn't quite sound like Mark. It doesn't match his style. No. I've never said that. And even if it did, you know what? You could say, well, it doesn't quite match the perfectly, you know, the style of Mark. But you know what it does match? The rest of the Bible. Yeah. It marked, it, the, 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 the last 11 verses, they match the style of Matthew. They, thank you. They, they match the, the style of Luke, of John, of Acts. They match all the way they end. It, it's, it's the exact same style as, all, as these other books and when they come to their end. The ending of these books and the ending of Mark are like this. And by the way, I still don't see how it's, you know, the style conflicts there in Mark. But even if it did, it would still make sense because of the fact that it matches the other books that are in the Bible because we're reading the Bible as an entire uh, book. For example, if you would, you're there in Mark, right? Keep something in Mark, but go over to Matthew chapter 28. I'll begin reading in verse 18. Notice how these books end. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Powerful ending in the Word of God. What a great way to end a book. What a great way to end the first book of the New Testament. God saying, I'm with you. Go and power and teach and preach and baptize. And to the end of the world, a commission, right? A charge. We read that and we're moved. We're inspired. Go over to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. Luke 24, I'll start reading in verse 46. How does it end? And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, that the re and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send you the promise of my, fa of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem and be and until ye be endued with power from on high. 
And he led them out as far to Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. So another great passage. You know, I always think about that. You know, this is just kind of going bird walk a little bit here. But whenever I read about that, you know, in Luke or in Acts where Jesus ascends out of their sight, I mean, if you wanted to get somebody's attention... <laughs> Start levitating. Yes. You know, the, I, you could you could recite the Encyclopedia Britannica to me, and I would be wrapped. You'd have my full attention if you started to float away. <laughs> you know, it's amazing. That's what he did. But what is he telling? It's the same message. You know, he's 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 telling them that that the, the repentance or remissions of sins should be preached in his name among all nations. The same charge is being laid, and he's making a, a powerful impact. What about John chapter 21? I'll just read to you from verse 25. Go to Acts 28. Acts 28. John chapter 21. How does it wrap up in verse 25? And there were also many other things which Jesus did, which if they should be written, every one, of, every one I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. Well, that leaves you just wondering about all the other things that Jesus did and said. You know, and hopefully we'll get to learn about those things in glory. <clears throat> Acts 28 verse 30. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came into him. This is, of course, you know, the end of Paul's life, the end of his story. After we've read just all these amazing things that Paul did, all the mission, uh, missionary journeys that he took, all the perils and, 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 and persecutions that he endured, and then here he is kind of wrapping up, and God's like giving him kind of this, I believe, a very peaceful end at the end of his life. He says, it says that he came, uh, he, was, he, he dwelt two whole years in his, in his own hired house and received all that came un, in unto him, meaning no man was forbidding him. He was able to have all these visitors. And he says, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching uh, thing, uh, those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. So just again, just the, the, of this book, just ending on this powerful note, that Paul just continued to do this great work for God, just preaching freely, complete confidence that the word of God was going forth. So, you know, how would the critics have marked to end then? If you just chop off those last verses, would, it, would, it, would the style match these other gospels, these other narratives? Would it, would, the, would, it, would it end that way? Well, let's go look. Look back there at Mark chapter 7. So here's where they, this is how they would like it to end. Because it doesn't match the style. Because there's a supposed doctrinal error in it. But go your way. Tell his disciples, and Peter and he that goeth forth, that, and Peter, that he goeth before you into Galilee, there shall ye see him. And he said, and he said, as he said unto you. And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulchre, and they were trembled and, and, were, and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. The end. Doesn't quite have the same powerful ending, does it? Now we leave the disciples just trembling, confused, not understanding, afraid, you know, <coughs> not telling any man. How do the other ones end? Right. Paul's just preaching. You know, there's more than, John ends, there's more than we could even talk about when it comes to Jesus. There's more to, you know, we couldn't even tell you everything there is to say. Luke ends with just him telling, you know, that, that they are to reach all nations. You know, same with Matthew, just preach the gospel and make disciples. You know, he's, he's powerful commissions to go out and do the work of God, these examples of people doing that. But here the critics, they would chop off these verses and just say, well, they just, they were so afraid. What if that was the only book you had? You lived in some, you know, God-hating country that, you know, censored the word of God and banned it, and you managed to get your hands on just a few scraps at the end of Mark. <laughs> would you close that? And would you come to the end of that and be like, wow, I just feel inspired. I just feel empowered and emboldened to do the work of God. No. You'd read that and be like, maybe I should be like them. Maybe I should stay afraid. Maybe I shouldn't say anything. So the reason, you know, one of the, the reason why their criticism of Mark doesn't make any sense is because this version doesn't match the over, overarching style of the, of the New Testament and, yea, even the Word of God when they just end it there. <coughs> so rather, you know, another, another tactic that they have is, you know, they don't just remove passages, but they try to cast doubt. That's what they're really doing. They're, they're saying, well, we're not going to remove it, but, you know, we'll just put a footnote in our Bibles. And that should be there. We, we who are learned understand that these, were, these came later and were added on and, and were not appropriate. And they shouldn't have been there. 
But here's the thing about that. The Bible says in 2 Peter that no prophecy of the Scriptures of any private interpretation for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So however that made it into Mark, whoever wrote that was moved by the Holy Ghost. They were inspired by God. And if God didn't want those last 11 verses in Mark, they wouldn't be there. And since God wants them there, they're still there. And that's where they're going to stay forever. And I don't care what publishing house or what critic or what scholar wants to try and attack the Word of God and bring it down and pull out passages, God's Word shall stand forever. Those verses will be there throughout all eternity. And they can rage and throw a fit and write their, their stupid essays. They're going to stay. They're not going anywhere. And they belong there. So rather than being able to just... So they, they you know should probably understand that. And, and ra so rather than just trying to rip these right out of the Bible, now they're just going to start trying to cast out. But that's not to say that you know, they don't try to remove passages or remove verses. They don't do it to the King James. right? They can't. There's just too many copies out there. You know, If somebody started publishing a King James Bible where, where verses were missing, you know how many people would notice? Yep. The most read version of the Bible, the most read book in history, People would notice. Be like, "Whoa! Put this guy at it. Don't buy it there. Put them out of business." Mm -hmm. You know, there'd be people would 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 throw a fit. <laughs> but that's why they have a lot of their new versions. That's why I got to get everybody off the King James, that old archaic book that nobody can understand, right. right? With the these and the thous. That's so hard to understand. The, thou, you know, all these old archaic words that nobody gets, like angle, right? Like a fishing rod? <laughs> that was one of that, what, that guy, James White, one of his criticisms. The, old, the, the, the word angle shouldn't be in there. No one even knows what that is. I mean, think, I'm an angler. Anybody who's been around fishing instantly knows what that passage is talking about. It's talking about fishing. Anyway. So what they do is say, well, let's get them off these, the King James. We can't touch that one because everyone's got it already. It's been read. We can't just go tearing pages of the King James. So let's get them on a new version. And then we'll start taking passages out. Then we'll start changing things. And that's exactly what they've done. So I'm just going to close up. Why should you stay away from these other versions? It's because, they're, one, they're not the Word of God, and they're removing things, important things. And the title of the sermon is The Satanic Attack on the King James Version. Okay? And whether these people that are criticizing the Word of God, criticizing the King James, casting doubt on the, on the King James Version, uh, disparaging the King James Version, whether they realize it or not, behind it is Satan. Whether they know it or not, they're doing the work of the devil. It's a satanic attack at its core. We'll say, how, how do you know that? Well, you know, this is an interesting fact that if you take 11 verses off the end of Mark, you know how many verses are left in the book of Mark? In the book of Mark, 666. Right. In a book that's called Mark. <laughs> Mark of the Beast, right? <laughs> Oh, I'm sure that's a coincidence. Right. Well, these, what about this? Is this coincidence? When in other, in other versions in Acts 8, I'll read to you, where they, where they, they scratch out verse 37. Yeah. In fact, you know what? Turn there. Yeah. I want you to see this. Turn there. Go to, go to Acts chapter 8. Because this is, I mean, this is a real important verse. Yep. And they just er, scratch it out. Well, you're going there. I'll Here's another verse they like to scratch out. Mark 9, 44 and 46. Where it talks about hell, where it says, Where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And he repeats himself a verse later. Where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. You know, if I had, if I had damned myself by, by, and we'll get into that here in a minute. If I had damned my soul to hell by diminishing aught from the word of God, I wouldn't want to read that either. Yeah. I wouldn't want to be reminded what's waiting for me. Where the fire is not quenched and the worm dieth not. And we'll, I'm getting ahead of myself, but that's exactly where people who uh, manipulate, who take from or add to the word of God are headed. Their names have been removed from the book of life. They're damned, they're reprobate. Acts chapter uh, 8, verse 36. You know, the, this is the story, of course, of the Ethiopian eunuch and Philip preaching to him. And it says that as they went on their way, they came to a certain water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Verse 37 is gone. In these versions, which is kind of a, a pretty important part. So their their versions would read, "You see, here is water with the him be baptized." And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, and both Philip and Eunuch, and he baptized them. But it doesn't answer the question, does it? And the answer to that question, "What did him be baptized?" is pretty important. 
He answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the... He says, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. He said, I, I, and he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So it's funny how they attack Mark, those last verses, Mark, 11, or Mark 16 15, for you know, having baptism and, uh, and believing in the same verse. right? But now here they just want to completely... Uh, uh, you know, they want to take out the, the, the key part of that, you know, the believing, and just leave the baptism. Well, you know, that doesn't really jive with the style of the rest of the book when it's just by baptism. <coughs> so you can see these are pretty big changes. You know, that's, uh, th that changes doctrine. And that's why I say, you know, unashamedly and, and, and with full assurance that the motivation to change the Bible is satanic at its source. And whether the agents that are be using by the devil, being used by the devil to, to implement those changes, realize it or not, they are serving the devil. This is another great example. Go to Isaiah chapter 14. Hopefully you kept something in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 14. When you get to Isaiah 14, we'll look at verse 12. Isaiah chapter 14. Well, how do you know it's satanic? How, was, how can you say it's satanic? Maybe, maybe these guys are just mixed up. Maybe they're just a little off. Maybe they're just a little too big for their britches. Maybe they're just a little proud, puffed up. You know, just kind of just, just overly intellectual. You know, maybe that's all it is. No, it's satanic. Look there in Isaiah chapter 14. It says, and this is talking about the devil, right? His fall. How, verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weakest the nations? So who is this talking about here? He's talking about Lucifer. <clears throat> now how does Isaiah chapter 4 in, ver in the NIV, ex excuse me, Isaiah 14 verse 12 in the I NIV read? It reads like this. You're looking there at the King James, verse 12. How are you fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn? Now, anyone who's read their Bible all the way through, that name should sound familiar, morning star. That's Jesus, exactly. But who is it in the King James? Lucifer. So what are they doing? They're taking a name for Jesus Christ and putting it in the place of Lucifer. Why would you do that? Why, why would they, what, what motive do you even have to do that? What's wrong with Lucifer? <laughs> I mean, isn't Lucifer more specific about maybe they have something, well, you know, he's one of the sons of God, they have this weird doctrine or whatever. But doesn't it make it more sense to just leave it Lucifer? Right. Then when you read the NIV, you have to go, Morning Star, well, who's that? What is that? When it says Lucifer, we know exactly who he's talking about. The devil. And if you, you know, Revelation 22, he said, I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. Revelation 22, verse 16. That's what Jesus Christ called himself. He called himself the morning star. And the NIV wants to say, how art thou fallen from heaven, morning star? And they're replacing Lucifer with the name given to Jesus Christ. You know, when I read that, that's all I needed to read. When I first started looking at the King James issue, someone gave me a pamphlet and just had a few verses. I read that and I said, case closed. Well, that's pretty simple in your thinking. Yeah. Yeah, any time that they're you know, attributing a name of Jesus Christ to the devil, it's pretty cut and dry for me. That, that pretty much you know, puts a bow on it. I'm done. And I remember there, I had a friend, he was really, I brought this up to him. I'm like, look, man, the King James Bible is the way to go. Well, how do you know that? I showed him that. And he was just like, wow, I never saw that. I never noticed that. But he went right on reading his stupid version. <laughs> Guess it wasn't enough for him. Of course, I don't think he was, he was even saved. But <coughs> so that's why I say it's satanic in nature. I don't think it's any, any you know, uh, any, any, any uh, surprise. You know, especially not a surprise that these new versions are, 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 are satanic to their core when you have open sodomites on the translation, board, on the translation boards. People that, you know, maybe not at one or two. I know for two, there were for sure two in the NIV, and one was a closet uh, a sodomite, and the other one was just out in the open, Right? The New International Version is straight out of the pits of hell. The man appointed to be the chairman of the Old Testament Committee of the NIV Committee on, on Bible Translation, Dr. Dr. Martin Woodstra, was a homosexual. I hope it's was because he's no longer with us. Also, Virginia Mollencott, who worked as the stylistic editor for the translation, is a proud lesbian. Some of, of Dr. Woodstra's collaborators on the NIV knew about his homosexuality, years ago during the translation process. That's who they have translating the Word of God. A reprobate. A guy who can't even understand the Word of God. <laughs> that hates the Word of God. Yeah, right. 
Does anyone want to retain God in his knowledge? Well, we're going to write a Bible. Why would you want to read that? Uh, the fact that a homosexual oversaw the translating of the Old Testament should be alarming to anyone who loves the Lord Jesus Christ and recognizes the Word of God as the most important book in their life. The sad truth is that at least two known homosexuals influenced NIV used in most churches today. The following quote was described to Dr. Woodstra, chairman of the NIV Old Testament Committee. There is nothing in the Old Testament that corresponds to homosexuality as we understand it today. Dr. Virginia Mollencott, a literary critic on the NIV translation, is an open lesbian in the Episcopal magazine Witness. She admits, my homosexuality has always been a part of me. Although Mollencott's lesbianism may possibly have been concealed from the NIV translators at the time she worked with them, the fact of the matter is that she did have an influential part as a literary cr critic in the work. Albeit the ho flaming homosexuality of Dr. Martin Woodstra was no secret to the committee on the biblical translation, Woodstra was the chairman, the top man in charge of the Old Testament work of the translation. Which, you know, so when you have a fag translating the Old Testament for you in the NIV, it's no wonder that the word sodomite is never used. No wonder they soften up the language there. They don't use a word like that. You know, and, 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 and I, hopefully I've laid enough groundwork. Can I give you enough examples to at least just shore you up once and for all that the King James Bible is the Word of God this morning? That you just need to believe it by faith. And it, it, we're not, we don't even have to spend a whole lot of time. I mean, I could start to talk about, the, we could start to compare the scholarship of the people who are translating these new versions and the people that for six years uh, immersed themselves in the translating of the King James Bible from another great Bible, the Bishop's Bible, and how we came to even have this book. It wasn't just them getting together, you know, uh, for, for a little while and, and talking things over in, at a conference table for a few hours a day and then going back to their work. I mean, they were immersed in this. They had all the resources available. And these weren't just, these, they certainly weren't sodomites. Right. They weren't open fags translating the Word of God. They were God-fearing men. Of the 54 translators, four were college presidents, six were bishops, five were deans, 30... 30 held PhDs, 39 held master's degrees. Uh, there were 41 university professors, 13 were masters of the Hebrew language, 10 had mastered Greek. Every man involved in the King James Bible translation believed in the verbal inspiration of the scriptures. All believed in the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ. All were men of prayer. Many were not only biblical scholars, but master linguists, but also God-called, spirit-filled preachers. Yet the translators considered themselves, quote, poor instruments to make God God's holy truth to be yet more and more known unto the people. I mean, people who had some real piety. Piety, excuse me. At the look at, 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 uh, a look at some of the statements of the translators themselves revealed the depth of their convictions concerning the eternal word of God. The, the spoke of the, they spoke of the scriptures as, quote, the intestinal treasure which excelleth all the riches of the earth. That's what they thought about the, the word of God, what they were doing that what they were making was excelling all the treasures of the earth. Amen. <clears throat> they acknowledged the Bible as being so full and so perfect, a fountain of most pure water springing up into everlasting life. They believed the original scriptures were from heaven, not earth, the author being God, not men, the penmen, such as were sanctified from the womb and endued with the principal portion of God's spirit. That's what they said. They referred to the Bible as God's word, God's truth, God's testimony, the word of salvation, not just the Old Testament, not just the New Testament, but God's word, God's truth, the word of salvation. Study of the scriptures brought light of understanding, stableness of persuasion, repentance from dead works, newness of life, holiness, peace, joy in the Holy Ghost, fellowship with the saints, participation of the heavenly nature, fruition of an inheritance immortal, undefiled, that shall never fade away. These are those, those are the words of the translators. From translators' epistle dedicatory, the dedication letter of their Bible translation to King James I, quote, Among all our joys, there was not one more filled in our, our hearts that the blessed continuance of the preaching of God's sacred word among us. I mean, these are people that love the word of God, that knew the Lord, that loved the Lord, that, that didn't, that they understood that they were they're undertaking one of the most, the most important task that they will ever take on in their life. Not some flaming sodomite who's going to get up there and just, you know, water down the language that he's, that, that he's guilty of. <clears throat> and here's the thing. 
you know, why is it that people can do that to the Word of God? Why are, why, why are there people like these, these men that gave us the King James, which are so holy and devout and serious about the Word of God, and then you have people like the, like the Sodomites and, the, and, the, and all these other so-called scholars translating the NIV? How can, how can somebody just go to the Word of God and be like, you know, no, don't like it, don't like it, doesn't belong, tear that out. How can they do that? Because they're damned. Okay, they are damned. Go to Revelation 22. We'll wrap it up here. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 4, Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I, excuse me, I command you. The Bible says in Proverbs 30, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. All these you know, these, these uh, critics of the Word of God, all these, uh, trans these, these people who want to create other versions and criticize uh, this book, you know what? They're found liars this morning. They're found false prophets, and they're damned. Revelation 22, verse 18, you say, I, well, you're going a little far with the whole damn thing. Well, let's go to the Bible again. Let's read the Bible and see what it says, and let it make up our mind this morning. That's, how, that's what makes up my mind. You know, I don't say that because that's how I feel about it. I say that because that's what the Bible teaches. It says in Revelation 22, verse 18, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. You mess with the word of God, God's going to mess with you. You write off God, God's going to write off you. <clears throat> so what are they trying to do? What, what is the point of this? It's a satanic attack this morning. That's what this is. It's not just them. It's more than them just trying to make money, which that's part of it. You know, but the love of money is the root of all evil. We understand that. Why are all these other versions coming out? Why is all this criticism out there? Why do they attack the word of God? It's, it's more than just you know, them trying to, to, to put themselves out there as some kind of scholar. What they're attempting to do this morning with these new versions and attacking the King James Bible is to take away the only divine light that we have in this dark world. That's what they're trying to do. They're trying, they're, this world's dark and sinful. The Bible says the whole world lieth in wickedness. You know, the, 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 the prince of the power of the, uh, of the air ruleth in this present world. You know, it's a dark world spiritually. You know, and we, this is the only light that you have this morning. This is it. The King James Bible. You know, if you speak Greek, if you're fluent in Greek, you can go pick up the Greek New Testament. You know what it says? The exact same thing this says. You could speak Hebrew if you're fluent in Hebrew and you can read Hebrew. Go read that. You know what you'll find out? It says the exact same thing this says. <coughs> and this is the only light we have in this world right here. This is it. There's no other alternative. It's not going to be in the Quran. It's not in the Tao Te Ching. It's not in any, you know, any of these other books that are so-called holy books. And none of them have the power that this book has. And what they're trying to do today is take this book out of your hand. And instead of giving you a light, they want to hand you, you know, a bell. <laughs> Something else. They want to give you a banana peel. You know, if you're in a dark room and I hand you a banana peel, is that really going to help you? It's probably you're dropping and end up slipping. And then you're really going to be in trouble. Right? Yep. It's not going to help you find your way. The Bible says, and go to 2 Peter chapter 1, we'll close here. Psalm 119, 2 Peter chapter 1. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So it's not just me, you know, trying to wax poetic up here. That's what this book is. It's a lamp. It's a light to light the way in the darkness. 2 Peter chapter, two, uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. We also have a more sure word of prophecy. We're unto well... Whereunto ye do well that you take heed as unto what? A light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star and rise in your hearts. Don't let anyone take this book out of your hand. You do well to take heed unto it. This is what's going light, to uh, light your path and guide you in life. This book right here. And, and don't doubt God's word because of some people who have fallen for one of Satan's most ancient lies. Yea, hath God said. Let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer.